Hey everybody, can you hear me? How's everybody going? Uh, doing? How's everybody going? Uh, welcome to the stream. My name is Bernard Chang, uh, professional comic book artist slash designer. Um, we're going to have a few guys join us later shortly. Uh, but uh, just wanted to say hello. How everybody? How's everybody doing? Uh, tonight we're going to be going over... Um, uh, we're going to be doing the uh, J.P. Leon, John Paul Leon tribute panel. Um, this is the last uh, 24 hours uh, for the campaign uh, for his Artist Edition Wintermen book. Um, it's been re we've been receiving tremendous, tremendous support from everybody, and I want to thank everybody for um, contributing and helping. Um, it is a uh, very, very special project. Um, all the proceeds are going to the uh, to Leon family, and uh, tonight is the last night. Um, if you guys get a chance, it's uh, over on zoop.com. Uh, zoop, actually, zoop.gg. I'll put the link in the chat. Uh, let's see. Oh, what are we doing here? All right. Uh, yeah, so, uh, I'm just waiting for a few people to, to jump on. Let me say hello to everybody in chat really quick. Thanks, Jerry, for the link. Looks like Lurky Lurk was on here first, but technically I don't think I was streaming. Um, I got a new VPN, and uh, while I was uh, away a couple weeks ago in the UK, I saw this uh, new show on TV that's got me hooked called uh, Naked Attraction. So it, if any of you know, you know. <laughs> um, so I've been watching it while I'm working, you know, just listening to it in the background. Um, it's pretty crazy, pretty crazy. You know, there's a lot of, uh, crazy shows overseas. Um, in the U.S., I don't know if we'd be able to get away with something like that, even on a cable TV. Uh, I mean, it's full frontal nudity. It starts out full frontal nudity. Um, but, and you have to have a, you have to be in the U.K. to watch it so the VPN helps. Um. But anyways, uh, Long Woo, Lurky Lurk, back and back. Uh, Lurky Lurk jumped on, but I don't think I was on. I had to turn off the VPN and restart the stream. Long Woo is going to be uh, lurking. He's uh, not feeling well, so get well, Lurk, uh, Long Woo. Um, hope you're doing okay. Get well. Uh, Beef Skeleton. What's up, Beef Skeleton? Jerry Ma is in the Epic Props, is in the chat. What's up, Jerry? Uh, Jamie Odell. What's up, Jamie Odell? We got our New Yorkers here tonight. Um, good to see you, Jamie O'Dell. D. Rogers. I guess, is D. Rogers technically new, the first one tonight? Because of the whole, I don't know, <coughs> the technical difficulties. Um, Jerry's going to be only in chat only tonight. Because <coughs> um, there was a whole, you know, like Lurky did jump on, but then I noticed uh, my stream wasn't connecting technically. Um, one hundred percent, something happened. Mm. Uh, original OD, Bill, good to see you. Um, how you doing? Uh, let's see. Yeah, we're gonna miss all of Jerry's commentary. Well, I'm gonna start off. I'm gonna wait a little bit. Um, let me see if uh, Tommy or Sean jumps on. Uh, the Discord, and then uh, we'll get going with the presentation. Sean's here. What's up, Sean? Or hey, what's up? Okay, I'm all here. right. Uh, let's see, Lurky Lurk. Thank you for the Prime sub. If you guys are just watching, make sure you hit the uh, follow button. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the thumbs up and the sub on YouTube. 
on Twitch. You can use your Amazon Prime to uh, to sub. All the uh, support from the sub is going towards paying for shipping. I should have another batch of stuff to ship out um, in another week or so. Right now, I'm buried in deadlines. Um, really haven't slept that much in the last few days. Uh, Jeremy Joe, how you doing, Jeremy Joe? Agnes Lamb, A19, good to see you, Agnes. Welcome back. Racer GRX, what's up, Racer GRX? Uh, Jerry is going to be out of town the next couple of weeks, so he's trying to get some work done. Uh, Jerry's going to be trying to get catch up on those uh, frequent flyer miles. Um, uh, let's see. <clears throat> we also got, uh, I think uh, tonight's uh, Battle of the Sketches is uh, the Wintermen in honor and celebration of uh, John Paul's, John Paul Leon's The Wintermen, the artist edition. Uh, tonight is the last night. Uh, I think it's going to end tomorrow morning. So um, we're catching it on the tail end. Uh, it's been tremendous, tremendous support. Let me see if I can pull up a browser. Tremendous support for the Peach Momoko print. The Peach Momoko print, yes, has, uh, oops. Uh, that has been uh, received overwhelmingly support over over and above the other ones. But, uh, you know, still great contributions by all the other artists as well. Um, she was a last second edition, and it's actually worked out great. Um, and it's a great piece, too. Let me see. Uh, Where is the Sean? What's what's been going on on your, on your end these days? Uh, not much. <laughs> Covers for Zenoscope. Yeah. And uh, finishing up some commissions. Okay. Did you already do? Ooh, wow! It's at one hundred and sixty-seven thousand. Yeah. That's tremendous. Let me pull this up on the browser. You guys can take a quick look at it. Know what I'm talking about. Is there still a way to get the Peach Mobile Footprint? Uh, are there any left? I think they're sold through. It sold out 100? There was only 100. Uh, awesome let me see here. The Kim Jong Ji, uh, Sean Phillips, Duncan Fogredo, Walter Simonson, Lee Weeks. Bill Sankevis just uploaded his, uh, Tommy Lee Edwards, and I guess it looks like it's unavailable. Wow, the Peaches Momoko, 75 out of 75. I'm actually going to be doing a, a, um, a piece, but it won't be a pr available as a print. It'll just be printed in the book. Um, I've been working on it, but it's taking a while. Uh, but yeah, wow, Peaches sold out of her 75. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Domo arigato gozaimasu. Uh, Peaches. Uh, Walter Simonson. There's a bunch here. These are the number ones. There's also some retailer bundles. Uh, the book itself, it's a premium book. It's an artist edition, so it's 11, uh, 12 by 18, 12 by 17. Because of the overwhelming support, uh, the originally the book was 186. It's been bumped up to 200 pages now. So that extra 14 pages, uh, it doesn't sound like a lot, but you know, if you think about it, that's almost an that's almost an entire com floppy comic book. Um, and uh, you know, we're also very fortunate. Everybody here, everybody involved with the project has been overwhelmingly supportive, and um, you know, donating their time and expertise. Let's see. Sean, did you get any of the prints? I did not yet. Um, right. I got the book. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I think I'm going to pick up a few of the prints. Wow. 167, 218. That's amazing. 870 supporters. Uh, this is tremendous. Um, this is uh, above um, what our initial uh, projections were. And, uh, you know, I think. Uh, this is a, a great thing that everybody's doing. And what they're going to get in return is a, a, an excellent product. 
Uh, it's being edited by Scott Dumbier, who uh, he's doing it on his own. Um, Scott usually does all the artist edition books for IDW. Um, uh, it's being designed. We're, uh, it's, uh, it's, I think it's pretty much already finished. We're just waiting for a couple of pieces to roll in. Um, we're going to try to inc include, there's layouts in there. You'll see layouts. You'll see um, uh, some other prints, some designs, concept designs that John did uh, when he started the project. And basically what we did was we took the original art from the Wintermen, um, scanned them in at high res, raw, so that we didn't clean any of it up. You can see... You can even see the blue line in the paper, right? The DC Comics paper. You can see all the uh, like the white paint, the white out, the scratches, the drawings, some of the underdrawings, um, and it's as close to holding the original art as you can get. Some of the pages have word balloons in it. Some of it don't. Um, some of them were lettered on the board. Some of them weren't. Um, you can see here even in this cover mock-up. The Wintermen, you know, that's some artist tape, you know, that uh, taped in the Wintermen there. You know, John Paul, for a very long time, did everything analog. Is that an analog? Is that the right word word to use in this situation, Sean? Traditional. Traditional. And uh, here's uh, Bill's Sienkiewicz's piece. He just put it up, uh, I think, earlier today or yesterday. Yeah, it looks really nice. Though. Yeah. And that's really in line with, uh, you know, really has that nice feel for John's uh, sense of space. This is Duncan's. Duncan's uh, Duncan and Sean were the two first people to uh, contribute uh, when Tommy reached out to them. Uh, when Tommy reached out to everyone, uh, everyone was just, yes. You know, there was no, we didn't have to wrangle anybody. Everybody was already. And, uh, you know, even uh, Peaches because she knew Tommy reached out and said that she was a huge fan of John and wanted to, you know, contribute a piece. So, uh, again... Peach was a huge fan, fan of John's? Yeah, that's what she said. She was a huge fan of John Paul's. Because oh. their style can be... Style is very different, yeah. Further, but yeah, yeah, very different. But that's great, though, because the love really shows in her piece. And it's a real standout piece, even for her. And then it just just blew out the door yeah the gray tones the uh mood in it uh it, yeah you can really you can really get a great sense of it um this is peach's piece completely sold out uh this is kim jun ji's there's also a video of it out uh kim jun ji drew this live you can see this as it comes to fruition in one sitting. Um, the two, JP and uh, John Paul and uh, Kim Jun Ji, they were uh, neighbors at a couple New York City Comic Con NYCCs. Um, and uh, they both uh, pretty much masters of the craft. Um, I really wish I would have been at that New York Comic Con because uh, the two of them sitting next to each other that's <laughs> that's like having uh, Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant or Michael Jordan and LeBron James sitting next to each other. Um, you know, two of the great. This is Lee Weeks' piece, The Super Soldier. And here's a portrait by uh, Bill Sienkiewicz. And then lastly, we've got uh, some pictures of his uh, studio. Golf Boy Sunday, thanks for the sub. Tier 1, 16 months. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, Way, what's up, Way? How you doing? Um, Simple Man's here. Good to see you, Simple Man, Tony. Uh, hope, hope you're staying warm in Iowa. How's the weather out there? Is it already wintry? Uh, Sean, is it already snowing in New York? And it's cold as hell, yeah. <clears throat> but it's going to warm up again. James, it's like, it's like 80 something degrees the other day here in LA. It was like sweating during the day. Uh, I went out to run an errand. I was like, holy shit, this is like hot. Um, 
you think it's global warming or <clears throat> yep what was the term before when we were, when we were younger you can't really use the term anymore right it's not kosher uh, to say uh, used to call it like uh, Indian summer but you can't really say that anymore well, you can't say it anymore I don't know isn't it a uh, well where, where there would be like a, a hot streak in the weather in the early fall after the summer is over and cool down then it'd be like a little bit of a hot streak but I think it's like way too late in the season for that so I don't know um, anyways golf boy thanks for the sub resub um, simple man thanks for the sub tier one seven months thank you thank you Tony so much how's uh, simple man junior you guys uh, drawing father and son uh, you see them catch uh, simples uh, simple man's also on twitch make sure you give him a follow uh, he sits there. Sometimes the sun draws with him in the background. By the way, how's your kid? Simple boy. Uh, simple boy. H how's your How's your kid doing in school, Sean? Oh, he's doing great. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't draw that much, but he's doing great. Hmm. By the way, uh, the book supposedly is in the mail. I checked earlier this afternoon. Uh, we're gonna have to wait for maybe the next stream. Uh, how to kiss like or how to kiss with confidence. Um, I actually bought two copies. I bought the $25 one, and then I bought the $5 one. Um, the $25 one supposedly arrived in the mail today, but I, when I checked earlier today, the mail hadn't come yet. Um, but uh, let's see. Man, you're, you're kissed with extra confidence. We got Who else we got on here? We got uh, Fletch. Hey, Fletch. Oh, and Courtney. Fletch and Courtney, what's up? Hello, hello. How are you guys doing? We're one of the same. Like you mentioned, it was 92 degrees on Sunday here in the valley. Yeah, LA. it was hot as fuck. It's like, what's going on here? You know, um, I was but last night. Last night was 52. <laughs> really? I was getting ready to like. Uh, I was putting on my like jacket, like a hoodie. I get outside and it's like, oh, it's like boiling. You don't go outside. I, well, I know. Sorry, you caught me. <laughs> Where, where is everybody's heads? I have to clean up this so are OBS. You drawing tonight? Uh, let's see. I'm gonna get through these. Uh, I'm gonna get through this uh, panel pitch uh, presentation, and then um, we'll see how late it goes. We're already 20 minutes in, so. So this is the presentation you do at the con. This is the presentation I have to do at the con. I'm. I'm kind of on the on the fence because I want to do this presentation at the other p conventions that I go to next year um, I think we'll be able to get a good it's not a big deal good crowd yeah, you can, yeah. but once you do it on the internet it's on internet forever right so no I don't think that people do that all the time no okay um, all right so let me see I have it uploaded let me open it up it's a keynote How are you guys doing today? Was uh, Corny wanted to learn how to kiss with confidence? Is that why? That's the only reason why I logged on today. I know. I was, I was hoping for, for a little <laughs> bit more. <sighs> Sorry. To learn a few things. Wow. I mean, if you. You're gonna send it to me first, right? If you want, I can. Yeah, it's gonna be. Uh, this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw straws, right? Uh, after we look through and review the book, we're gonna send it to someone. And then each week, that person will have to mail it to um, the next Whoever. person. And whoever lands on um, uh, uh, oh. <laughs> on, on what? Uh, I'm, I'm shipping it to Australia. Uh, yeah, I'm brain farting. <laughs> I'm crispy. Uh, my brain. F I had a brain fart there. Uh, that that's the last one. <laughs> so crispy. Gets, gets to give it to his son for uh, his eighth birthday, seventh birthday. Uh, oh, no. So oh, I no. think when everyone gets it, they should either write or draw something in the margins. Yeah, I just, think, right. You know. Just to pass it on and then like a note, like, oh, I tried this technique, you know, or something. Or like, oh, this doesn't work because if you twirl, I mean, again, I, we got to look through it, you know, see how. Oh, oh man, I was gonna put on lipstick and kiss like you know the one of the empty pages. Yeah, well let me see. I mean, you still can, you still should. 
But let me see if I can maybe get. Maybe there's a practice page. Maybe there is. Oh, that's right. Put on lipstick and then kiss a page. Oh, that's a good you idea. Like match it up. It's really just yeah, we, Make we sure have to do that. The maybe the inside front cover. That's usually blank, right? <laughs> that, that's actually a pretty good idea. What do you think about that? But then you can have like 50 people who have. I mean, imagine the. And this is how like, COVID it? starts. <laughs> All right, say something, Fletch. <clears throat> What's that? Okay, all right, okay. I'm putting your, your head next to your uh, Discord. Say something, Corny. Uh, what's up? Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting each person's respect. I'm reducing the size of the heads per uh, people's uh, complaints. So. Yeah, there's important presentation tonight. We need a lot of space. Uh, let me see. Where is... I got to clean up this... Uh, I had to clean up this uh, this browse this OBS. Sean. All right. Okay. Uh. <coughs> Should we get ready to go? Should we start? Today. Oh shit. Jerry's in chat, right? Jerry's in chat. Yeah. Uh, Why isn't he on? He thinks he's special. Yeah, Jerry's got a lot of work to do. Uh, he's going to be traveling a lot in the next uh, couple of weeks. He's coming to LA, and he didn't tell me. That's right. Shh. Uh, <laughs> how'd you know? <laughs> uh, Women find out everything. Well, that's true. That's true. That's true. Uh, all right, here we go. Let me uh, pull this up here. Mm. Keynote. Okay. All right. Let me uh, resize the screen. Guys, bear with me here. Thank you for your patience. D. Rogers wants to know if you own any John Paul originals. I do and not own any. Surprisingly, you do not. I did not own any John Paul originals. Um, I, I do have some, like like sketches that we did for fun at conventions together, right? So I have those. Um, but I don't have any, like, pages from any of his work, like his comic book work. Um you know, to be very to here. Here's another thing. While I was at, uh, off subject, while I was in the UK, I noticed that a lot of people use the word massive or brilliant. I mean, yeah, brilliant, right? <coughs> brilliant. Oh, that's, they overuse that's brilliant, or oh, that's massive. It's massive. So I'm wondering, like, are there words in the American um, uh, dialect or f way of speaking that? we don't notice that we use like cool or to be honest like they say that too in the uk a lot to be honest um and i noticed that here in the u.s now a lot of people will say you know to be honest that uh, and then um are there, are there any kind of phrases that a lot of people use here dude dude southern california yeah so dude. like like if everything's a dude everything's a dude so like if if we were yeah. from if uh if jim was here he'd be like yeah america you americans you use dude a lot. Your Jimbo's here. Good to see your Jimbo. Uh, Golf Boy Sunday's here. All right. Well, Roy Batty's that. here. Roy Batty, thanks for the sub with the Prime. Five months. Thank you, Roy Batty. Kevin P. West is here. Good to see Kevin P. West. Um, I'm trying to catch up on the chat. <coughs> Excuse you. Gosh. Courtney. Um, I burp way louder than that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Ooh. kidding. Uh, I will when I have um, when I'm drinking the rest of my sparkly water. Oh shit! Wildstorm's here. Uh, okay, all right. Let me jump. Let me start uh, on this presentation. So you guys, if you, um, Sean, if you have any, or Carson McKinney's here, SVA or Get Back Coach. Um, okay, let's get let's get going. I'm gonna jump through chat. If you guys see anything in chat during this presentation. Um, just hit the buzzer uh, 
and then um, let me see here. Is this good enough? Should I make the window bigger? Okay. I think that's okay. fine. All right. This is like a disclosure statement. Okay. Hmm. How's that? I dare you to sue me. I dare you. Okay. This is uh. take off the um, the banner on the top there we go all right Chao Paul Leon I wish I had some music for this uh, <laughs> you're gonna make everyone cry if you do that <laughs> uh, how do I no I got nothing Okay, so uh, keep it going, Fletch. Let me <laughs> let me take off this uh, uh, chat box. Where's the chat box? Did you fix the spelling of I Alex Tooth? I did. I think I did in this version. I should. It said Alex Tooth for the longest time, and uh, yeah. So ish. It should be fixed. Here we go. Chat box. Okay. All right. Here we go. A retrospective of the work from the master storyteller. Oops. Uh, when I graduate... Okay. Uh, we're not off to a good start. Sorry, right, take your time. All right, here we go. When I start, when I graduated SVA, I remember they had us fill out a form. For what purpose, I don't recall. But among the questions asked was something along the lines of, "Where do you see yourself in twenty years?" or what are your goals for the next several years? I remember my answer was to build a body of work and to be highly regarded amongst my peers or something like that. That was a, a quote that John had uh, during a, a recent interview, recent a couple years ago. Uh, but this really is uh, defines kind of the artist that he was. He was uh, purely dedicated to the craft of uh, storytelling, of comic book, sequential illustration. Um, and he didn't um, concern himself about with popularity, with um, any of the kind of frivolous uh, aspects uh, of this business. He was purely about uh, the craft. This was one of his last pieces, the Batman, I think it was a Batman Incorporated. Uh, do you know about that, um, Fletch? Uh oh. I might have, I might have cut off. Um... He's on mute. Oh, he's on mute. Okay. Sorry. Uh, this was, I think, a Future State. Future, st future oh, future State. Oh, yeah, Future State Batman, right. The printed version, uh, the uh, lettering in the back. Uh, was blocked out. Um, okay. Why do I get out of this? Okay. John Paul Leon was truly a unique talent, admired and envied by all of us in the industry for his ability to convey the complexities of the world with a distilled simplicity of line and the mastery of the craft that few can ever hope to achieve. He's passed much too soon, leaving us to wonder what further heights he would have achieved, but thankful for the work he's left behind that will inspire generations of artists to come. Our hearts at Marvel go out to his family, loved ones, friends, and fans. Uh, Joe Quesada, Marvel Entertainment, EVP, Creative Director.
one of the greatest artists of our generation. He was also one of the nicest and most talented creators one could be lucky enough to have met. So young and still creating the very best work of his career, I remain in awe of both his unrivaled draftsmanship and his stellar design work, both of which were simply unparalleled, technically just so precise and perfect. But what really made me a fan was how he squeezed in every bit of emotion in life in every single image he created. Jim Lee, DC Comics publisher, co-chief uh, creative officer. So the two giants in our industry, uh, Joe Quesada, Jim Lee, um, these were their quotes about John uh, shortly after um, John passed. Uh, the Leons from Cuba to New York City to Miami. Uh, John Paul Leon was born in New York City on April 26, 1972. His father and mother were both born in Havana, Cuba, but only met each other after their families immigrated to New York City. Uh, first came the elder brother, Alex, and one year later, JP arrived. The Leons would relocate to Miami, Florida in 1976 when John was four, setting up roots in the Hialeah area. From a young age, John had a fondness for art. As soon as he could hold a pencil, he was drawing. Both John and Alex, along with their childhood friends, discovered comics at a local 7-Eleven. So like many of us growing up at the time, you know, comics was much more widely available. You could go to your local bodega, 7-Eleven, drugstore, and you can find newsstands with comics on them. This is a picture of John Paul when he was uh, 22. Uh, the Leon brothers would soon begin to craft their very own superhero adventures. While they were only one year apart in age difference, they had separate school schedules. So back then in Miami, um, you, you'd only go to school maybe in the morning and you'd come back in the afternoon, depending on the grade. Um, John had classes in the morning while Alex attended school in the afternoon. Alex would write the next pages of their superhero story each day in the morning and hand them off to John as a return home around midday, at which point John would start breathing life into their tales of action and adventure. And then each night over dinner, the brothers would go over their work and plot out the story arcs. Uh, so that's the two, the two, brother, the two Leon brothers um, on the picture on the right. Um, obviously, John is the, the one on the left. They're very similar in appearance. If you were to ever bump into them, bump into Alex in person, uh, very reminiscent of John. Stat, how he stands, how he walks. Um, you can look at the two drawings on the left. The one is the Starship Enterprise, where I think we all grew up fans of Star Trek. Um, and uh, that was 1976, so he was four years old at the time. Even in that, in the drawing, you can tell he's already developing a sense of perspective uh, in the nasials. Is that how you pronounce that? The uh, two engine things on the Enterprise. You know, there's already a, and even in the saucer section, um, it's not just a circle, but it actually looks like a, a three-dimensional um, saucer section. And then there's another drawing later on in uh, junior high, elementary school years. They start developing these uh, superhero comics. Uh, this is around teenage, early teenage years. Uh, these would be stories that uh, Alex would write and then John would draw. They'd come up with their own characters. Uh, I think we all have very similar kind of drawings when we were young. Um, but John also started, they also, you know, were actually not just doing drawings of figures, uh, but they were also um, doing storytelling pages. And uh, they had a whole library of their own characters. Um, Jonathan Cable. You can see already there's a really great sense of uh, place, environment, sense of storytelling, obviously, uh, Heavy, heavy influence from the uh, Rambo movies. You see there's a character very reminiscent of St Sylvester Stallone. Uh, we used to 
mock and kind of like uh, joke around about uh, movie lines. That was a thing that John was really into was movie lines, lines from movies. We'd always play games about, uh, you know, quote a line and then see if we can guess the movie. But already at a very young age, early teenage years, Some of the stories also delved into kind of like uh, fantasy, not just superheroes. And then again, a balance of sci-fi. You can see now at a at a junior high teenage years, the saucer section, high school years, the saucer section was much. I mean, the Enterprise is much more developed three-dimensionally, um, grasping a lot in terms of the um, perspective aspect. Not just drawing iconic things, but also drawing things in um, in nice uh, realism. I mean, we grew up back in the eighties. Jimbo's right. I mean, growing up in the eighties and nineties, you know, there's not a lot of stuff. You got to watch movies pretty much to get a lot of your pop pop culture. Reading comics, and movies, and television, um, and then uh, there was no internet. So what you would have to do is. Uh, you go home and you draw stuff that you saw. New World School of the Arts, Miami High School days. Uh, John was part of the first class of the New World School of the Arts in downtown Miami uh, with a student body of only 425 students from all around Miami-Dade County. It was the first ever arts magnet program in Miami designed after the famed LaGuardia High School Music, of Art, Music and Art and Performing Arts in New York City where students majored in either music, theater, dance, or visual art. Uh, so this is when I first met John. Uh, we were both uh, 14, 15 years old, ninth grade, uh, s somewhere towards the spring of our ninth grade year. Uh, I had heard about uh, this new art program opening, um, this new art, art high school that you'd basically be going to this high school instead of your regular high school. This was located, again, centralized downtown Miami. Um, but you had to audition to get in. Um, so I signed up. I went. It was like on a Saturday. You had to bring a portfolio, I think about 8 to 12 pieces. Uh, and then you had a sit-down session where we had to draw a um, like a still life. So they set up like you know a chair, a cloth, uh, I don't know, a bunch of different things, clock. And we were all sitting in horses, you know, like the uh, art studio horses, the, the chairs that kind of like have a thing that sticks up so you can put your drawing board on. And um, during one of the breaks, uh, they would call each, they would call people in individually, but then everybody else would sit and draw the, the uh, still lifes. Uh, during one of the breaks, I, uh, I pulled out my sketchbook that I had with me, and then I started doing a, uh, a sketch of Thor. And uh, this kid that was sitting next to me looks over my shoulder, and he was like, oh, so uh, you're a fan of the uh, God of Thunder? And uh, I was like, yeah, I, I like Thor, but I actually, I like Walter Simonson more. You know, it's really why I'm getting the book. And his, li his eyes lit up, you know, he's like, oh, Walter Simonson. And, uh, you know, the kid that was sitting next to me was John. And uh, so we started doing the break, we started talking about all of these books that we're reading, all of these artists that we liked. Um, and, you know, again, back then, comics wasn't as cool <laughs> as it is now. Um, it was sometimes very rare to find uh, another person that knew who Thor was or, you know, everybody kind of knew Spider-Man or Batman, but, you know, even the X-Men, like, oh, you know about the X-Men? You read the X-Men? Oh, you know John Byrne, Dave Cockrum, uh, Paul Smith? Um, you know, so that really began, uh, that was kind of like a niche, uh, crowd there, but, um, yeah, we started uh, hitting it off, talking about comics, talking about art, uh, while at New World, uh, while New World was a world-class, uh, art high school, uh, teachers forbid the students from drawing comic books and superheroes, and instead focused more on fine arts fundamentals, like figure drawing, painting, and sculpture, so, during high school, the teachers didn't allow us to draw superhero stuff. 
you know they they were kind of like ah that's you know you want to be an artist you want to be a fine artist you want to know you want to learn how to paint and draw and uh you know looking back like at the time it was a, there was a little bit of a conflict right because we all kind of like that comic book stuff is kind of what got us into drawing um but uh, you know looking back uh it was actually a good thing because uh, i encourage all young artists to really appreciate and understand the fundamentals of art um, before focusing on a specific medium or genre uh, but you know we could still do our own drawings on the side we just couldn't turn it in for assignments or they just didn't want to see us um, you know doing too much extracurricular work outside of whatever the assignments that they've given us uh, so JP looked to satiate his creativity by mailing off sample work uh, to some of his favorite publications uh, one of them being TSR Dungeons and Dragons uh, and to none of his fellow peers surprise a few weeks later he received a professional illustration assignment and again back then you know uh, there's no there's no internet there's no email um, so he went through uh, all the books we would get like those TSR Dungeons and Dragons guidebooks or those magazines and you looked in the masthead uh, where it listed um, the editors or the publishers the art director and then there might be an address at the bottom at the very bottom in the fine print and uh, he sent some copies mailed uh, sent some uh, took some photocopies of his work mailed it in and then you know we're all like keeping our fingers crossed a couple weeks later uh, he got his first professional assignment this is around the age of 16 10th 11th grade already working as a professional um, so here we are. We, they gave us uh, these large sketchbooks in, in high school. So in the sketchbooks, we could do whatever we wanted, because um, the teachers weren't, weren't technically allowed to look at our sketchbooks. Uh, that's to also promote kind of creativity. You know, the sketchbook is a private thing for an artist. It's uh, like a diary, and uh, you know, the teachers encourage us to kind of be free and do whatever we wanted. If anyone wanted to look at our sketchbooks, they would have to get our permission. Um, so it, it really became uh, a, a great place to explore and satiate a lot of the other you know youthful kind of energies that we had so um, these were some of uh, John's uh, fantasy work although this guy on the far right has a gun I never really asked him why but uh, New World School of the Arts uh, before you know it it was time to go to high those are senior pictures Let's see if this plays. Uh, I don't think, can you guys hear the audio? I don't think you guys can hear the audio. Yeah, and back then, Saturday morning cartoons. Okay, we cannot. So this was during, we had a softball team. We didn't have a, our, our high school didn't have an athletics program because it was a serious art school. Uh, but I started a, um, an athletic program, and I started a uh, softball team. We had a softball, basketball team. We had a soccer club. Um, so this was during one of the games. Uh, we, I also had a uh, camcorder, and uh, so we tape our games. <laughs> um, and this is him going up and saying that he's uh, the person with the camera is another fellow student, Jason Raymond is asking him uh, where are you going to college next year this is uh, towards the end of our senior year in high school John's like I'm gonna go to SVA in New York City uh, School of Visual Arts uh, returned to New York City John returned to his birth city for college attending the acclaimed School of Visual Arts College in Manhattan on an illustration scholarship uh, he would study under some of uh, the top artists in the country including Will Eisner Walter Simonson, Jack Potter, and John Ruggieri. Uh, in New York City, John would soak up all the city had to offer, uh, drawing on subways, museums, and one of his favorite, now closed places, the Automat. Uh, some of these drawings on the right, uh, drawings that, uh, life drawings uh, and the subway. You know, drawing on the subway, you gotta be quick, especially in New York City. You know, you don't want people to see you drawing them. They might. <laughs> You might get into a few confrontations, like, yo, what are you doing? Uh, also, the subway station, you know, so when you're riding the train, it's very bumpy, right? So it's not as smooth as you think it is. Uh, so when you're drawing, you got to be quick. People move around. They might get off at the next station. Um, so you got to be quick, light on your feet. 
it really develops a lot of great observation skills. And SVA was a great school. That's very golf boy. I mean, they had Walter Simonson. Um, I think Mazzucchelli. The Mazzucchelli. No, Mazzucchelli taught. Well, Sean, you had Mazzucchelli as kind of like an instructor. Um, Klaus Jansen was a teacher at uh, SVA. So they didn't. Although they didn't have a major in sequential illustration, they had a lot of working professionals. Uh, Sean, th did Mazzucchelli teach at SVA or no? Um, yeah, I think he did. Yeah. yeah. So School of Visual Arts, and uh, School of Visual Arts is a college. It's, it's on 23rd Street in Manhattan. It's not your typical kind of college with a campus. I went to Pratt, um, and uh, John went to SVA. Uh, they're both well-established art schools, but very different in their nature. Pratt had a traditional campus. Uh, Pratt had an athletics program. That's partly why I chose to go there. They have a library, a cafeteria, a student union. Um, SVA was like one, uh, like a few buildings in New York City. So there was no campus. Basically, if you walk down the street, uh, it's just an office building. And inside an office building is the school, you know, different floors, different uh, classes. Uh, they didn't even have uh, freshman, sophomore year, they didn't have dorms, uh, traditional dorms. They had to, uh, they had uh, the building, the school owned a few apartment, uh, a few apartments in Jersey. They also had a, a, a program where the freshman, sophomore uh, could live in a YMCA. Um, so if any of you have ever lived in, ever gone to New York and, and stayed at a YMCA, I mean, it's the size of a closet, um, literally the size of a closet. There was, his room was uh, basically the bed and a, and a cabinet, and that was it. Um, not a lot of walking room. You had a little bit of room where you can put your feet next to the bed, um, and then a closed cabinet with an op uh, open, exposed uh, closet. Uh, but we would go and, uh, you know, um, the, I mean, the city, but the city was the place to be. So um, on weekends or late at night, uh, I'd go into uh, New York City. We'd walk around. Uh, we'd walk around the city, explore all these massive built. there. I got to say massive again, these uh, office buildings. There's a lot of decent office furniture that people threw out at night that we would, like, kind of call back and take back to our studios. Uh, like, you know, really expensive chairs, but maybe missing a wheel. <laughs> um, and uh, we walked by the uh, Smith of Walensky's. It was near where the SVA was. We always say, oh, do you smell the uh, aroma of the, the steaks? Uh, you know, being uh, kind of uh, poor college students, you know, we really couldn't uh, afford any of that stuff. But... We always said that, you know, if we ever get to the point when our, uh, where we start working, we're going to go eat there one day. Um, even during college, uh, John's girlfriend went to Wellesley College up in Boston. Uh, I was able to convince my girlfriend to attend <laughs> Wellesley as well. So we uh, would go up there together and, you know, uh, have double dates. Like, well, I mean, hang out, you know. So... Um, it was a very uh, innocent, simple time in our lives. Um, so at, while at the School of Visual Arts, artist discovery, in addition to studying under industry giants, uh, John would also discover new artists that began to shape and refine his skill set. Artists such as Bernie Fuchs, Robert Fawcett, Austin Briggs, and Noel Sickles. So this is, uh, these are some of the artists that Tommy actually spoke about uh, last time he was here, along with Cliff. Uh, Chang, these are like other illustrators. They're not really known for comic book work, or they actually never did comic book work or sequentials. But we really began to influence kind of uh, John's um, artistic sensibilities. And uh, so not only was he influenced by comic book artists, but he was really beginning to take a much more illustrative position in his craft. Uh, portfolio. So every artist knows that the portfolio is king. Halfway through his freshman year, John begins building his comic book sequentials portfolio of storytelling pages. So this is to any of the young artists out there that are interested in getting into art, into comic book art, um, children's books, or anything like that. Uh, you really need a portfolio. You know, there's a lot of artists going to school, art school. Art school is very expensive. Um, I am very encouraging of people going to school. I'm a very big proponent of going to art school. 
However, you have to understand that just because you graduate from art school with a degree doesn't guarantee you anything beyond having that paper, certificate, um, that degree. Um, it might get you a look because of networking from other alums who graduated and went through your program or from employers that have other artists that, uh, that they know have gone through the similar kind of training that you went through. Uh, but really, ultimately, it comes down to your portfolio, your work. So you can get straight A's in school, but that doesn't guarantee you anything in terms of art. Um, so when we were freshmen, we started working on, um, you know, we wanted to start breaking into comics. And uh, John was a big fan of Superman at the time, and he developed a Superman portfolio. So this is, um, by the beginning of his sophomore year, his second year, he has edited it down to t about 12 pages, sequential pages, uh, known as the Superman pages, and begins to showcase them at local comic book conventions. So uh, we call them the Superman pages. Any, any one of John Paul's uh, peers, students, uh, friends at the time, these were uh, legendary. This is uh, drawn by a 18, 19 year old John Paul Leon. And these are sample pages that he used uh, to break in. Um, and I think, I believe this is also a story that he just wrote. So you can already see a sense of like perspective. Um, actually, when we were in the very early stages of uh, considering doing this artist edition book for John Paul, The Winter Men, um, we met up with uh, Scott, D Scott Dunbeer. And Scott was uh, like, man, you know, I have the impression of John is always starts with these Superman pages. You know, so a lot of it is, uh, it's, it's very impactful in the sense that, you know, to see such, uh, such work from such a young artist uh, leaves, a, leaves an impression on a lot of people. Um, you can see a lot of influence from Walter Simonson in terms of the hatching, the texturing. Uh, but the storytelling in itself has a very impactful kind of uh, feel to it. Here Superman blows away um, the fire using his breath and then flies up the elevators, or down the elevators actually. Well, and it's an old school Superman too. You can. You know, it's not the young Superman. This is like almost a, a, a mixture of the old black and white television Superman version. Um, who's that, uh, the actor guy? Where, you know, like the the underwear, the belt comes up halfway through the stomach. Um, but it's a very traditional approach to, you know, the all-American kind of superhero. And he goes in there, uh, <coughs> even this uh, last panel on the uh, left page where Superman's in silhouette. You just see the uh, S lifting up uh, uh, the girl, the woman that was in the ele trapped elevator with the smoke. Um, even this far right image here, upper right hand corner, um, you can really see a very stylistic approach to his work. Uh, John's early work was very, very stylized, very cartoonish, very different in a way from. Um, his latter work, his more current, you know, his more recent work. Um, the faces are very kind of cartoonish, very stylized. There's a lot of expression in them. Um, but you can also see uh, different sensibilities in the line work. There's a few more pages in this that I didn't include. Otherwise, I felt it was going to be a little bit too long. But um, he wasn't afraid to tackle crowd scenes, wasn't afraid to tackle environments. Um, even acting, uh, you know, we look at the uh, Joker. Actually, one of the Joker in the story, the pages that are omitted from this, uh, the Joker turns out to be one of the firemen that set the fire initially, and he was standing around, um, and then tried to escape, but Superman caught him. Um, and all to prior to this page on the left, the Joker shoots at Superman, but Superman catches the bullets, so he lets he lets his hand go, and the bullets fall out. And then at the bottom, you again see now he's changed back into the, the Clark Kent. George Reeves, thanks to Jimbo. So these are, um, again, this is uh, 18, 19 years old. We're freshman, sophomore year in college. Uh, at first we had uh, 
put together our Captain America pages. I showed earlier, in one of the earlier streams, we had tackled a Captain America story together. Uh, I mean, he did his own version. Uh, but then after that, he started, he, went, he did his own story with Superman. Um, and that's when I did my story with the uh, Justice League or Justice Society. So I believe that was a soft, uh, sophomore year, January, December, January, we went to a New York Comic Con. This was at the uh, uh, Penn Plaza Hotel, I believe. It wasn't at the Javits Center. This was at one of the smaller hotels. Um, and we carried our portfolios around, showed them to a bunch of different people. Um, John ultimately gets hooked up uh, and lands his first gig, uh, late 1991, I think it was December. Uh, at the age of 19 and only a second year at SVA, John attends a small comic book convention in New York City and lands his first professional comic book uh, gig, a uh, short Robocop story on the anthology series Dark Horse Comics. Immediately following that, they gave him a three-issue uh, miniseries, also Robocop Prime Suspect. And the book would not come out until 1992, a year later. Um, or mm, like eight, eight, nine months later. Uh, here you can see, like again, very stylized, very... Uh, I, I, hesitate to use the word cartoonish but in comparison to, to again to his later work uh, very different uh, his more recent work much more naturalistic um, but here um, he's having fun there's a lot of acting there's a lot of uh, uh, action very dynamic he hated the coloring no offense to the colorist but John was always a very traditional traditionalist with coloring. Very, f at that time he didn't want any kind of rendering; he just wanted flat colors. Um, and when you get to stuff like where the armor on the Robocop is being rendered, or there's these bursts in the background, he was just a, not a big fan of, and it would <laughs> upset him to no means, to no ends. Um, even the rendering of the gun here, I remember talking about this. It's like. The rest of the stuff is not rendered except for the gun. It just throws it completely off, um, you know. So uh, these are things that uh, ultimately, when he began later on in his career, uh, you know, so just, uh, current, just color your own stuff. Don't you just learn Photoshop and color your own stuff? Um, you ultimately have more control over your work. Uh, Michael Davis, A.K.A. M O F U. Um, Bad Boy Studio. Uh, through a network of fellow art students at SVA, John is introduced to Michael Davis, a professional comic book artist who runs the DC Comics New Talent Program, quote unquote, uh, which later became his own studio called the Bad Boy Studio, <clears throat> not to be confused with uh, P. Diddy. Uh, Michael was also in the process of launching Milestone Media, an imprint of DC Comics, a new imprint. Uh, with a focus on multicultural representation in the superhero genre, along with Dwayne McDuffie, Derek Dingle, and Dennis Cowan. Uh, this is a picture taken at Michael's loft in Jersey. Uh, that's John over there on the far left with a plaid shirt. Um, I dressed kind of preppy back then. Sean, did I used to dress like this when I show up at Valiant? <laughs> yeah, from the very first day. Uh, we always wear a tie. Uh, whenever I went into the office initially. <clears throat> I mean, that was what Michael taught us a lot. Michael, uh, Michael taught us about the business of comics, um, how you present yourself. You know, we're already at a disadvantage, slight disadvantage in a sense that we're 19, 20 years old. And uh, what major employer is going to hire and put behind tens of thousands of dollars uh, of marketing, of merchandise, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, behind a 19, 20 year old kid. Uh, so he was like, you got to present yourself in a professional manner. Uh, that starts with the portfolio. And then it also goes down to how you dress. Uh, when you go to these comic book conventions and back then um, you could bring your portfolio to comic book conventions at each company's booth. There would be a table with an editor sitting there or a couple editors. And basically you just wait in the line half an hour, 45 minutes or whatever. And until the editor saw you, they would flip your work, give you like a few minutes. Um, and that was kind of your audition. So 
Michael is like, you got to present yourself. Every every other kid that's waiting in line, or every other artist that's waiting in line, they're gonna have a T-shirt, they're gonna have sneakers or whatever kind of ragtag, you know, outfit that they just, they just threw on. Uh, you got to treat it like it's a business, like you're going in for a job interview, working at a Fortune 500 company. Um, and uh, if you can get that out of the way, and then just let your work speak for itself. Um, really was uh, great advice um, so but I, o I would also dress like that to go to Michael's place because I wanted to you know present something uh, that, hey man I want to I want to start working um, so uh, that was at Michael's uh, loft it's like a three four story loft it's an amazing place um, and so at the 1992 com uh, San Diego Comic Con um, actually, that was also the show that you first went to, right, Sean? 1992 San Diego Comic Con? Yeah. Uh, although um, I, I don't think we, yeah, we didn't meet, but we yeah. were at the same place. Yeah, we didn't meet. John and I went, um, we stayed at the uh, Radisson Suites, uh, northern part of uh, San Diego, uh, right next to where the um, masquerade thing is at the theater. And, uh, you know, back then San Diego was not as well built out as it is now. It was, uh, was Courtney there already in 1992? Or was she even alive in 1992? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it was like, Sean, where did you stay when you went to the San Diego Comic Con back then? You know, honestly, it's kind of funny, but I'm not sure where I was, but it was with my mom. Oh, <laughs> well, you, you go to conventions even till today with your mom. <laughs> yeah. so, well, not anymore. Yeah, but <laughs> She's too old now. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we, we saved that money that uh, that year. Uh, Michael was like, "Look, if you guys come out to San Diego, it's the largest convention." At then, you know, it's maybe like a fifth of the size it is now. Not even. It's like if you come out to San Diego, uh, I will show. He will show us to all of his industry contacts. Uh, just save your money, work on your portfolio, and if you can come out to that show. So, well, both of us went and. Uh, you know, we flew out there. We brought our portfolios, and Michael brought us to everybody that he knew: Mike, Mike uh, Dick Giordano, um, Paul Levitz, uh, everybody at DC. Um, he didn't know anybody at, at Valiant. Valiant was on the very last day, um, on the very last day on the way out. Uh, Valiant's booth was right next to the exit. Right, Sean was like right in the front, right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I was like, John, let's just wait. Uh, let's just, you know, wait in line and see if, uh, you know, because Bob was there and I think Barry Windsor Smith was there. They're looking at portfolios. I'm like, let's just wait in line. Let's, you know, there's not, no harm. We still got enough time to make the airport. Um, and let's just uh, get our portfolios reviewed by one more, <coughs> one more company. And at that show, too, Image had just launched that summer. Uh, so, Wild, uh, so Wildcats had just come out. Spawn had just come out. Um, it was a huge, huge San Diego Comic Con, in a sense that um, industry impacting. Valiant at that summer had just launched Unity, um, and it was becoming extremely popular. Uh, Wizard was just coming onto the map. Wizard magazine promoting comics. Um, so there was a lot of things, kind of, a lot of things moving, um, in flux, and. Uh, Bob looked at my work, and the rest for me was history. But at that show, too, um, Michael had told us it was between John Paul and myself to draw static. Um, we were the two finalists. Although, technically, initially, Michael was supposed to draw static. Um, Michael Davis. But um, they were looking at getting two young guys in there, John Paul and myself. And... Uh, so at the at that show, Milestone officially announces their first four titles: Hardware Icon, Blood Syndicate, and Static. Um, and at the age of twenty, John is announced as the main artist on Static, a story about a teenager having an accidental exposure to a radioactive chemical, developing the ability to control electromagnetic fields. Um, so it wasn't until after San Diego that they announced um, the creative teams, but they announced the titles. Uh, Dennis Cowan had actually done promo art for the series already had done the cover um, I remember when I got back to Miami when we both got back to Miami 
like a week or so later, Michael called me up and said, uh, gave me the news that they were going to go with John. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it, it hurt. I wanted to work. Uh, but at the same time, you know, my best friend was the one that got the job. And uh, uh, how can you be upset about that, right? And, um, you know, you, uh, happiness also comes in many different forms. And to know that my best friend was also going to be working and launching this new book, um, you know, you couldn't, I couldn't stay down for too long. So his work on static, you can kind of see is it's really evolved a little bit. Every, every book, every project, there is continue to take steps forward. This is around the age of 20. The book didn't come out until 1993. Um, uh, but he started working on this uh, when we got back into school, so around September, October. Um, started working on static. Uh, you can see there's a lot of uh, progression in the work. Again, still everything feels like a sense of place. Um, this is a, a later piece of static shock. Static Shock of all the Milestone Media titles, Static is the only one which continues today in the DC Universe, although they just relaunched Milestone. But Static really is the one that has uh, the most acclaim. Um, and that also, it had its, its own animated show, Static Shock, on the, WB, on the WB network. Uh came out for four seasons, 52 episodes. It was also the first ever animated superhero show to feature an African-American in the lead role. I mean, funny thing is, like, for the longest time, um, you know, Wizard Magazine was out there, but again, John didn't do a lot of promotion. I remember when I started drawing Dr. Mirage um, for Valiant, John was still doing Static. I'd be like, John, let's go, let's go out and let's go do some store signings. Let's go to some shows. Um, let's get out there and promote and, you know, promote ourselves as, as artists. And, and uh, he, 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 wasn't a huge fan of that. He's just like, no, nah, man, I'm just going to stay home. I'm going to draw. Um, there's not enough time in the day to draw already. You know, so uh, he was very much, again, about the craft. These are some static shock uh, images later on that he did. Uh, you can see, again, the progression um, in the artwork, in the drawing the technical ability, the storytelling. All right, see there, Sean, I, ch I changed the uh, changed the slide. Did I miss out on anything else? Intro to Alex Toth. At Milestone, Dennis Cowan would introduce him to the work of another legendary comic book artist, Alex Toth. This actually, this slide used to say Alex Tooth. <laughs> uh, this would change the trajectory of John Paul's work for the remainder of his career. It placed a particular focus on simplica simplification of his quote-unquote style of drawing. It wasn't that John was drawing less when in fact he was actually drawing even more, but rather refinement of each and every line and shapes that he actually puts pen to paper, pencil to paper. So what I mean by that and is that if you ever again look at the work, uh, look at the original work, John would draw the entire figures out and uh, then begin to spot the blacks in terms of the inks and shadows. Um, there's a lot of comic book artists out, or a lot of artists out there that will just, they won't even figure out the, the torso on static, that they'll just, uh, or the legs here on the left. Um, uh, and they'll just kind of X in the area, meaning that's, got to you know ink, ink all that in um, but he would actually draw everything beforehand out and then after it's fully drawn then go in and spot all the shadows and blacks and then when he inks that would be the finished version so it's actually more work than a lot of what other traditional kind of what you might consider noir artists would go through um, but there's also a, a payoff in that the work that he produces is solid. There is a undeniable um, sensibility about it that it feels like everything is there, even though a lot of it is hidden in shadows. And and going back to Toth, 
Toth had a simplicity in his drawing, so which reflected in kind of John's shifting of his style. And it's that he does all the work beforehand in drawing and sketching and laying everything out. Um, and then at the ultimate, when you're inking, it's choosing one line as opposed to two or three to define a particular shape. Um, so, again, although it might look on the surface somewhat slightly simplified, um, it's actually extremely complex. And again, through all of this, uh, at, during this time he was still in New York, he would continue to draw. Uh, every moment that he had, you know, sitting on the subway, you can see some of the artwork too, again, it's a little bit more refinement. It's very different than some of his comic book work. These are kind of line contours, uh, very quick gesture drawings. Um, some of them are just shapes, but some of them he gets has time to really kind of define a little bit. Uh, but again, on subway, it's a great tool. If you guys ever live in a major city, you're in a tube, subway system. I think it would be very hard on a bus. The bus shakes too much. Uh, but, you know, if you're sitting in a cafe somewhere, you're sitting on a train, or sitting on an airplane. You know. Oh, Courtney, okay. Good night, Courtney. Sorry, Courtney has to go. Uh, we'll try to stream next week. Oh. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Okay, no I'll problem. I'll catch you guys next time. Good job, though. Great job. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So, uh, the mid part of his career, uh, after Static, he jumped on Shadow Cabinet, Worlds Collide Icon, uh, Superman did a Superman Annual Special, Shadow of the Bat, X Men, Logan, Further Adventures of Cyclops, Phoenix, that was like a mini series. He was a regular artist on Challenge of the Unknown on DC, uh, Moon Knight, Daredevil, The Creeper, Grendel. And uh, again, you begin to really see this uh, using shapes, blocking out particular images. Uh, very dramatic in his work. This is uh, the Superman annual, Man of Steel annual. <coughs> we'll actually come back to this piece later too. Uh, but this is probably like a third, a quarter of way into his career. You, you look on the left, the uh, Superman is holding back uh, kind of a runaway train. And the figure is very stylized. It's you know very exaggerated at certain points. Um, he's beginning to really carve out particular definitions of shapes, uh, of, of figures of the torso, the arms. Um, on the far right, you can see um, kind of a natural. Uh, his style really lent to Batman. Um, that's probably one of his um, kind of more well-known. Uh, characters that he would draw um, but really begin to define a lot of his uh, work later on in his career uh, then came Earth X the redefining of the Marvel Universe spanning 12 issues this maxi series was the pinnacle of Marvel Comics at the turn of the 20th century initially concepted by Alex Ross the series would be created by Jim Kruger with John and would re-envision the entire Marvel Comics universe, bringing into popularity, and this is my own theory, the concept of the multiverse, featuring alternate reality versions of our beloved heroes. Have you guys, uh, oh, actually, Fletch, how many times have you seen uh, Eternals? Or has Sean seen Eternals yet? I know in Eternals... I, I only once. Only once? Only once? Oh. <laughs> I know they give they give John a thanks at the end, right? Yes, they did. Yeah, so I yeah. I think the um, uh, these guys right here, who are these guys? The uh, what are these guys called? The big giant people. Celestials. The Celestials, right? Uh, I think there were like a lot of the design of the Celestials, and uh, that sense really came from John Paul's Earth X work. Right? To me, when I saw the trailer, uh, I was like, this is straight from John Paul. And that book was extremely difficult because you think about not only how complex and you have to, A, you have to redesign everything. Uh, B, the amount of characters that are on every single page 
and on every single panel. Uh, I remember I used to talk to him. He complained all the time about um, you know that book because it's just when you're drawing a book that only has a main lead, uh, like Nightwing only has is Nightwing, right? Dick Grayson, uh, and then maybe he's fighting a bad guy, a couple bad guys. Um, you're not trying to cram in a team book. A team book is different. Like working on Teen Titans, um, I got to make sure in most panels there's at least two, three, four different uh, team members. And if they're fighting someone, you know they're usually fighting a team or you know a gang of like bad guys. So it's just a massive amount of um, layout. You have the situational so, um, problems that you have to solve. Sean, would you rather draw a solo book or a team book? Well, <clears throat> probably a team book. Really? Otherwise, there's not yeah. enough. Yeah, because there's not enough stuff. I mean, I think my work looks good when it's really dense. So, and the same with John Paul stuff. I mean, if you get a, if there wasn't a lot of stuff there, it would be less impressive. So sometimes I know Jim Chung probably does the same thing too. You look for that big melee to just kind of really shine. It gives you a chance to shine. So it's it's way harder. It takes a lot longer. But in the end, I mean, once it's done, it's really impressive. Yeah. yeah. I mean, your first book was a team book, Ryan right? the Future Force. Yeah. How what was your first royalty check? It was like 99,893, <laughs> something? Like something? Oh, yeah. Okay, anyways. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, the Winterman. Uh, John would embark on his first and only creator-owned project starting in 2003, 2002 actually technically, 2003 with former uh, School of Visual Arts classmate Brett Lewis called The Winterman. Um, it was a very intriguing concept. Um, you know, post-collapse post Soviet Union, criminal gangs rule the ages of crumbled government. Moscow policeman Chris Kalinov encounters the heart of the new Russia at every turn fighting friends and enemies alike as he searches for a missing girl in the secret of the Soviet superpower code, super project code named Winter. A series was initially slated to publish through Vertigo, but was then switched to Wildstorm. So this is the, what the artist edition is based off of. You'll see some of this work in there as well, some of the rough work, layouts, different versions. I was actually in Miami staying with John Paul um, early on uh, when he was working on this project. And a lot of these pages he would redraw, you know, multiple times. I was there for like a week. And uh, during that one week, he did two pages. One page he redrew four or five times. At the end of each day, I thought, oh, that's a great page. All right, man. Uh, what's the next page? And then when we'd start the next day, he had completely erased it and started over. Um, so, but that was, you know, how dedicated he was to the craft. I would tell him, like, John, the, you know, the, each, each version got better, um, but the incremental increase in, um, in improvements, most of the readers are not going to really see that. And it's probably more better to well just finish it and then you know try to continue to move make the improvements later on uh, but he was very stubborn John was all about making every single piece every single page every single panel as best as he could sometimes it wouldn't leave the studio until he was fully satisfied and um, you know that was the kind of artist that he was and also the kind of person. So some of this work again in, in its original form. You can also tell like okay, this is this version has obviously been scanned in but kind of cleaned up a little bit. And here is a little bit more rough. You can kind of see the uh, the variances in the page. I mean, his original art is like heavy because there's so many layering of like uh, pro white, like white paint that we redraw, repaint, redraw.
So going into exploring kind of his um, style, let me see what I'm doing the time. Um, this is a sample page. I mean, this is a page from from the series. On the right is the uh, dialogue, is the script, um, and uh, on the far left, what he would do is uh, John was kind of the um, Daniel Day Lewis of comic book artists in the sense the method acting. He would immerse himself in the story. And so when he got a script or a, you know, a, a plot, uh, he would delve into research and look through, look for images, look for um, basically research all different kinds of references um, f for every scene and then also break it down to each panel. Um, and he would you know, spend a couple of days doing this before he would actually start drawing. Um, because he wanted to immerse himself into that world. And, I mean, a lot of this he could draw out of his head, but he also wanted it to be technically accurate. And in this sense, too, because it's a Russian kind of timepiece, um, he wanted uh, to uh, be able to convey that and translate that visually in the most authentic form possible. So panel one above, uh, you can see just the... The images on the left-hand side, you know, there's a Russian square. There's a, actually a, uh, there's a picture of Don Cheadle. Is it Don Cheadle or Chidi? I always forget. And, uh, you know, there's other Russian propaganda. There's also pictures on the lower left-hand corner of um, Russian, old Russian vintage people, like in the winter, and then maybe some art piece, right? And the Don Chidi piece was, um, he liked that because of the glove that he was wearing. He was looking for outfits, right? And uh, that's the, the Russian soldier, the hammer. Um, in the second panel, um, just a kind of a standard shot of these Russian soldier suits. Uh, so when the soldier program first started out, they also had these suits, uh, ar armored kind of tech. But it was a, a, an era piece. So again, it's not mod completely modern. And there's a particular aspect to... Russian architecture or Russian technology at the time. Um, so he looked up some cosmonaut suits, again, some propaganda. He also looked up some hockey masks, some goalie masks. So he thought, you know, the mask should have a cage on it. And, uh, you know, it's not every day you see like a kind of a, a goalie mask. It has different unique patterns to it. And then also inside of a tank, you get a really sense of the rivets, the equipment, the technology at the time. Um, panel three, there's a se actually there's a three panel sequence. The one on the left was just more inspiration for the upper left hand panel. Uh, the second one where um, the Drost is, uh, <coughs> uh, actually Nikki is shooting up a coke machine. So he's like, okay, well, you know, guys are obviously using AK-47s. Uh, there's a coke machine. What does a coke machine look like? I mean, we see that every day, but um, he's pulling out references for it. And then the third panel um, is Nina. Uh, so he wanted to capture what this Nina looked like, uh, mostly in the hairstyle, uh, authentic to that time era. Um, and then the last uh, panel of the page uh, w was this uh, woman's room, but the room, you know, it's a little, uh, it's a, a particular style of room. Um, there's like a... Uh, uh, vodka bottle, there's uh, stuffed animals, and also uh, Kalinov is uh, supposedly nude in this. So this is a compilation of the panels, uh, layouts on the far left. Um, and these are all drawn on 8.5 by 11, uh, kind of Xerox paper. So he would work, again, traditionally, a traditional format. Um, and he would redraw and sometimes cut and paste some of the uh, layout pages. Um, on the far right is the uh, actual pencils, so that's an 11 by 17. Um, sometimes he would redraw them, sometimes he would take the layouts and the light box onto uh, the board, onto the, onto the final paper, just to save a little bit of time. Um, but you can see some of it transferring over. Uh, more so in the third tier, there's also changes and revisions. Um, again, on the middle panel there where Nikki's shooting up the coke machine he actually flips the camera um, 
so that we're behind Nikki. Uh, you can see here on the far left is the ink version. Uh, there is a an attempt when he's penciling, he's figuring out putting um, one of the characters in, in shadow on the third tier, the first panel on the left. Uh, but then in the inks, he decided against that. Really wanted to show more of the face. Um, other aspects of the details in the room, the details in the armor, um, all of that going into play. All of that work going into each and in individual panels. Um, this next page, uh, you can see again a firefight between some of Nikki's boys and the Boy Scout Blue attack team. They've ambushed the truck. Nikki's men are on the defense. Uh, maybe a street sign showing, uh, same as on the map to follow on the bottom. Uh, and then some caption and dialogue. Uh, and then description for a panel two, which is mainly a map. So again, we're in a Russian street. There's these two rival gangs are fighting against each other. Um, they're using some kind of heavy mil military equipment, ramming against a Coca-Cola or Pepsi truck. Uh, but these are kind of soldier, guerrilla soldiers in streetwear. Uh, not necessarily army um, guys, but even in the bottom, you know, see some of the reference that we pull out. Uh, this was the uh, first layout um, sequence where he's kind of sketching everything out. But after compiling the references uh, from the layout, you can kind of see going into the pencils. Some of the changes in the figures, some changes in the head. There's a Joe Paterno looking kind of guy on the uh, squatting down on, on the left hand side behind the fence. Uh, our main guy is running. Um, and then he has other soldiers in the back kind of chasing him and firing at him. And then switching it out, pencils on the right, inks on the left, uh, really begin to take shape. You can see things being popped, uh, pushed in the foreground, other things pushed in the background, just with uh, line weight, with uh, shadows that he's using. You know, in the background buildings, he's kept it very light, not a tremendous ton of rendering. In the foreground, midground elements, a little bit more rendering um, so that we get, even just with the line work and with the ink drawing, uh, a separation of um, planes. And then if you go back again to the referencing, you can kind of see where some of the stuff that he pulled from, the Pepsi truck. So, and... When, when John used referencing, it was more to, again, understand what he's drawing, but he would draw it, redraw it in a completely different angle. Uh, there are a lot of comic book artists that we know that uh, will take the drawing and then basically trace it and um, use that image kind of as is. And um, John was a complete technical genius so that he could you give him a a picture of something and he could redraw it in a completely different angle um, just from you know one shot so and then going from the inks uh, to the finished colors at this point you know he began to do a little bit more color holds separations um, back when John and I actually did a Carl Malone book he didn't really like color holds I would like to think after that, <laughs> uh, he started seeing the light a little bit. Soft drink gang wars. That's right, Jimbo. It should get serious in Russia. Uh, cancer diagnosis in late 2007 while working on the final issue of The Winter Men. Uh, John uh, began to experience um, medical issues. And when the test results came back, uh, it revealed that he had colon cancer. Uh, he immediately began treatment, um, but he kept this condition a secret from everyone except his family and closest friends. Uh, there was no public announcement, um, not even his editors knew. So uh, this is a, another key point um, in understanding John, um, not just as an artist, but also as, as a human, as a person, as a man. Um, we were all, of course, all kind of really devastated when we first, uh, when you know, he first told me that he had cancer. Uh, but he, he was insistent on not telling anyone, not letting anyone know. Um, he didn't want any pity 
from anyone for his condition. And he didn't want any pity in terms of like how people looked at his work. Um, he wanted purely for it to stand on its own merits. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of times where we would like, you know, John, maybe you know, you should come out with this. We can, um, you know, but he was like, no, let's, uh, you got to keep it a secret. Um, again, even some of his editors didn't know at the time. Um, uh, you know, he didn't want anybody, even uh, the companies, to know in a sense that for them to give him any um, other secondary considerations beyond the merit of his art. So he would go to chemo and take, you know, get, get treatment. Um, and then he would maybe take a day or so off and then get back straight to work. So that last issue, that uh, Winterman special, the final sixth issue, um, he actually wrote most of it and, uh, and drew it while he was uh, going through cancer treatment. And... Uh, but you would never, you would never be able to tell. Uh, in fact, the work, um, <laughs> amazingly, got even better and uh, got even more powerful. And in many ways, um, or in some ways, it simplified a lot of his approach. But it was very reflective of how he, uh, how he was as an artist. Yeah, a relentless dedication to his art and his craft. Yeah. I mean, we'd go to these conventions. Um, you know, Sean, we, we, were at, we had a, a studio called The Boulevard at the time. And it was kind of like a, uh, an excuse for us to hang out a couple times a year. You know, John lived in Miami. I was in uh, L.A. Sean was in New York. Tommy was in North Carolina. Uh, Trevor um, was here in L.A., but going to a convention in Texas or Chicago uh, or San Diego or Seattle or Toronto uh, or even North Carolina was an opportunity for us to kind of hang out. Uh, when John, um, you know, had cancer the first time, he fought it off three times. Um, he wasn't able to attend. And, uh, uh, you know, people would ask, you know, hey, where's uh, John, you know? Um, and uh, we couldn't say anything. You know, he's, oh, he's, he's home, he's busy, he's, he's got some deadlines. And uh, also when, you know, the books were, you know, the Winterman took a while to come out, in part because of this, in, in some ways, also because of other issues. Um, you know, people would be like, hey, when, when is this, uh, you know, when's the book coming out? When is the, what's, what's taking him so long? And it's like, you know, um, it was difficult biting our tongue. Um, and, uh, but yeah, we got through it. And, uh, and when the winter man was complete, uh, John continued to push forward. And he also loved to draw. <coughs> That's his daughter on the left hand side. Uh, you see Tommy. Uh, Sean, uh, I don't think Sean was here for this. That was in, uh, Sean, was that in San Diego or was that, that might have been in Toronto? I don't think it was in um, San Diego. I was there, but uh, I wasn't being drawn. So <laughs> I remember him doing that. I mean, we'd sit in a hotel room and we'd just like draw after the convention, right? <laughs> and then the lower left hand, uh, the bottom bottom ones is a studio and also uh, just him out. Um, I think that might have been in the UK. And I mean, that's a simple, like that drawing of like Tommy, that was like five minutes. Observing, shooting the shit. But after the Wintermen, Gotham Knights, Static Shock, Smallville, New X Men, Weapon X, Tom Strong. Um, he had a run on Scalp as the cover. Uh, not DMX, what is that? Uh, um, I keep forgetting. DMZ. DMZ, thanks. Um, I mean, the, the amount of credentials. This is. 
after the after winter men during this uh there was a period of time where the cancer had was in remission uh then came back and then he fought it off again um and then it wasn't until 2019 uh, that it came back again. Um, this going back to the Superman cover on the far right, Superman Unchained. And uh, reflecting back to the initial work, the first time he kind of tackled this kind of a similar type of uh, drawing. Again, going back to the original Superman, for the first one that he did, holding back the train. Um, you can see again just comparison the his approach um, the far left is his uh, first initial rough layout you can see he kind of pieced it together he had drawn something else and then he cut it up and they pasted two pieces together um, and then he decided to flip it from right to left left to right and in part because you know the magic of sequential illustration right here in the West, we read left to right. I mean, in the East, we read right to left. But here, we, re we read left to right. And so if we had positioned the train on the far right coming to the left, uh, it's almost as if, he, because of the action of Superman, and because of the Superman book, and we know that most people know that Superman flies, uh, it could also be perceived that Superman is, might be pushing the, the train a little bit off of the track or up because we're reading, the motion is going that way. So when the brain is seeing a, an image on the left and an image on the right, and it sees one first and the second, and the other one second, there is a slight movement in motion, um, at least in theory, right? But if you flip it and you see the train first and the Superman next, um, there you get the f a, a much greater impact of him trying to hold it back or hold it up, or somehow, in, in essence, stopping um, the train. Um, very similar angle, but just by flipping it gives you a very different degree of um, emotional context. Uh, moving from that, he also then begins to block some of the shapes. Um, this is done in a computer. So now, by now, he's bought a computer. <laughs> he's kind of like Sean. In many ways, you guys were very resistant towards technology. Um, but then on the far right is the uh, finished inks. Again, the amount of detail, the referencing, the authenticity of the piece. Even though it's a vintage, you can tell it's a vintage train. You can see the kids, the people inside the train, the rivets, the metro metropolis interborough train. All of those details um, placed in. Even though some of it gets covered up by the logo ultimately. Um, it's still there and what happens is the eye when you're looking at it you know your brain registers all that information um, and it gives you a sense of like wow it feels very solid but you might not know exactly why but all of that goes in there and then also even just leaving the background completely blank gives it a sense that oh this train is going to fall off the page it's going to fall off the cover into kind of this abyss Sean will go digital when he turns 80. This is a, a page from Sergeant Fury. Um, you can tell from the left is the pencil and the right is the inks. See upper left hand top panel, Sergeant Fury. The gun is completely drawn in, all the details and rivets. Um, and then when he goes to ink, he decides he wants to cast it in shadow. Because uh, it has much more, uh, much more impact. Um, the slight changes to I think uh, that's the Black Widow. Is that the Black Widow? I I'm not too familiar with Sergeant Fury. I don't think it's Black Widow, but the female character on the left. Um, and then even in the texture in the third tier, uh, third tier, where that's the basically the hood of the car and the windshield. He's drawing everything in. He shadowed everything underneath the canopy behind the, the passenger in the back of the car. But then when he goes in inks, you can tell from the windshield, everything you see through the windshield, there is no um, shadow. It's just straight 
and it begins to simplify and it begins to choose just from looking at that you know that the glass is intact the windshield is intact it's not like an open window um, and uh, yeah I mean I don't know what else to you when you look at the plane on the last uh, last panel uh, different textures of rendering of the ground versus the rendering of the metallic plane um, really begins to separate and create a lot of depth in a single drawing uh, this was from Batman Incorporated. No, this is. I always get these books confused. The pencils on the left, inks on the right. You can see that, you know, he draws the full figure in. He actually added the cape in second, second af afterwards. I wanted to make sure that the anatomy and everything was correct. Um, and the cape is again something you drape on. It makes a lot of sense. He also changes the background in the library behind Batman's shoulder to really push even more depth and then in that you look at Batman the pencil the cowl and the ma the mask and the neck is predominantly in shadow um, in the original in the original pencil version but then when he went to ink he actually made the background behind him pushed it further back put that in shadow and then made his cowl a little bit more lit up so that again created a little much more depth a different feeling a sense of like wow this is a huge library and it extends all the way back um, and uh, that also Batman being cast on light a little bit uh, has a almost like a spotlight on him this sequence um, Sean what was the writer's name that was sitting uh, with you at the signing at Jerry's booth in New York Name. The writer? I'm not yeah, oh. he's sitting next to Yeah, me. I forgot his name. Yeah. yeah so it was kind of a coincidence he was right there. Yeah. So we, uh, he actually is the guy that wrote this. Uh, I forgot his name again. I'm bad with names. But this was a sequence that, you know, he basically, the writer only has asked John that, you know, Batman is going to go through this sequence in this library. And he's going to go down to the, um, to an area where he's going to discover a secret hidden room. Um, <clears throat> and the layout in this, you know, John really with this, uh, story was Scott Wilson thank you Jerry um, really began to take a um, you know really excellent I think uh, you know really creative storytelling choices um, and that Batman as he as he kind of goes through this library winding library the layout of that also intertwines and moves your eye through and you really get a sequence of him a sense of him kind of moving through this tremendous you know, looking at this, you can almost smell the books. You can smell the wood, the wrought iron. Um, it's just beautiful. Uh, Batman Creature of the Night, set in a world where the Batman is actual comic book. It explores the story of a young comic book reading kid obsessed with the Cape Crusader who loses his parents to a violent crime, mirroring his favorite superhero. Written by Kurt Busiek, drawn by John. This would be his last miniseries before um, he passed. And so this is, um, I believe this is still available in trade. I don't know why some of the images are kind of blurry on here. Were they blurry during the presentation in New York? Sean, do you remember? No, they weren't. Not uh, at all. I don't know why some of this is blurry. And then these were, um, after a 14-year battle with cancer, John passed away uh, on Sunday morning, May 2nd of this year, uh, surrounded by his family and friends. He drew into the moment he could no longer hold that pencil. Um, John is survived by his wife, Christina, his daughter, and his brother, Alex, and his family. Uh, yeah, it was uh, uh, all of 2020. You know, John had uh, spent every every other week going and getting chemo. Um, the cancer had come back. Uh, it was very aggressive. Uh, it had taken a toll on him. Uh, but he continued to work. Um, most of that was through uh, Batman Creature of the Night. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, it was, it's, 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 you know, life is short. What can you say? Uh, I was just talking with John, uh, I believe on a, a day before, uh, he uh, was admitted to the hospital for the last time. We were talking about, uh, kind of silly stuff. Every, we call each other at least once a week and talk while we're working. Um, uh, some of you know that when you're working, um, your brain starts thinking about a lot of different things. And so it's a good distraction to talk to someone um, to kind of stop those demons from coming up. Um, little did I know that uh, a day or so later, uh, John would be in the hospital. We, Tommy and I had actually already planned on going to Miami. We had just gotten our second shot, uh, vaccine shot. So we were prepping for um, a trip to go out to Miami uh, to spend a few weeks with uh, John. Um, later that month, uh, and then uh, we got the call that he was in the hospital. So um, Tommy got there on Wednesday. I got there Thursday morning, um, and we were at least able to spend a few days with him. Um, but uh, um, you know, uh, things shouldn't be taken for granted, and. Uh, I always remember to, you know, tell people that you love in your life when you get the opportunity to. This is a, a the last part of this presentation is um, going through a lot of the some of the commissions that he had. Um, another thing that John really appreciated was doing commissions. Um, in fact, you know, some would say argue that you know this was some of uh, some of his most favorite things to do were commissions and. Um, in part, sometimes he gets to work on characters that he might not have an opportunity to. Uh, this was a Berserker cover. Uh, this was a Ragnarok commission. Um, this was a uh, Batman commission. This commission piece actually, um, uh, Tommy and I were able to help a little bit going through uh, John's studio after he passed to help organize some of the work. Um, going through his files, for this one commission, he had 117 reference pictures of subway stations, subway tracks, above the, tr above the track, below the track, in the subway station, different trains, um, just for a commission piece. And, uh, and he had like six or eight different images of money satchels. Um, and for this, I believe uh, Lambert has his piece. And... You know, he just said, you know, John, just do something, you know, that you really en enjoy doing. And so he kind of thought of um, uh, <coughs> this scene. And just by looking at it, well, you know, a lot of different components to it. Um, of course, we recognize the above-ground uh, train platform, probably somewhere in what technically would be Brooklyn or Gotham. Um, the train itself is a little bit older or vintage, or has at least that feel, so it kind of goes along with this Gotham mythology. Um, there's also some newer buildings in the back. Um, there's even some graffiti. There's some, um, you know, it's a tattoo shop. Um, and then you have like a money satchel where the money is kind of floating in the air. There's a train coming. Why is Batman holding this person? Is he stopping him? Is he wrestling him? What is going on? There's all these sense of, and then even in the background, it's kind of like starry or snowy. Um, so there's so many things going on. There's just this one simple kind of commission piece. Um, the other piece was a Ragnarok. I think that was a Ragnarok for Walter Simonson. Uh, some of these he would do on the spot at conventions. Uh, some of them he did back in the studio. There's a Winterman, um, Black Widow, Superman, Batman. This left one is a is an animated show, right? Does anybody anybody pinpoint that out? The Blade Runner one. 
Or it's like a European, it's a European comic book. Corto Maltese. Yeah, Corto Maltese, right. Um, Blackhawk, Spirit. I think he did a Spirit story. He had a lot of fun with that, where they incorporate the Spirit in every every page, or every page is a full-page splash. Here's a more recent look at uh, Robocop. There is a uh, there's the Beta Ray Bill. There's uh, Batman fighting Mr. Freeze. We used to that was his nickname. He had two nicknames uh, amongst our, our, our studio, uh, Mr. Freeze and the Claw. Uh, the Claw was how he held his pencil. It was kind of like a claw hand would like arch back uh, but Mr. Freeze was uh, every uh, hotel we stayed at he would uh, turn that sucker down that AC down to like as cold as you could get it uh, sometimes you can even see your breath in the air it was so cold but because he liked to uh, snuggle or huddle underneath the uh, the sheets um, uh, and I'd be like John why don't you just uh <laughs> Why don't you just not turn the AC so cold, so damn cold? That way you don't have to, um, uh, you know, bury yourself under these blankets, heavy blankets. And he's like, yeah, but it's not the same. It's not the same. And it's true, man. Uh, I don't do it at home because I'm too cheap. But whenever I go to a hotel, I'm, that's the first thing I do is turn the AC down as cold as I can get it. And there is a there is a particular comfort and getting underneath that comforter. I think some of that is like New York. Um, these are again a couple more commission pieces. And then some pictures of John working in a studio at home. You see, you have his monitor on the left hand side where you he, where he have his reference up. Uh, but then he had back-to-back -back <coughs> table setups. Uh, these are some shows. That's with Walter. Um, on the far right, uh, there's uh, him working at a convention. I think that might be that might be Heroes. Yeah, there's uh, John on the left. It's actually uh, early 2020. Uh, they went on a family vacation. Uh, it's a Hellboy piece on the right. And uh, that's a picture of his uh, studio in Miami. A lot of reference books. A lot of equipment. Paintings, pictures, illustrations. So that's it. So this is the artist edition. Again, tonight is the last night. Um, it's been two hours, so I don't think I'm going to be drawing on this stream. But Sean, did you already do your drawing? I'm uh, still working on it. <coughs> it's tough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's a very different style than me, so I'm kind of struggling with it. But I'll show it tomorrow. Okay. Um, does anybody have their drawing put up on the uh, Discord I can show? A couple people. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Let me pull this up. So we've got some people. Golf Boy. Uh, D. Rogers. Golf Boy. All right. I saw <laughs> Golf Boys golf on this. Boy. Yeah. Let me, let me see if I can pull this up. Anybody By the way, a great, really great tribute, and uh, yeah, a lot of stuff I didn't know about John, and uh, really good. Thanks. Did, Thank you. Did I miss anybody? In, did I miss any questions in the chat, or uh, anybody have any questions before? Uh, here's on the Discord. 
golf boy had his nice one. Wow, look at that. It's all rendered. Now, the stars in the back, did you use a, a toothbrush or did you use a credit card? Um, <laughs> so many different ways to do the stars. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, whenever, you know, when we went to these conventions, uh, I would get these tablecloths, right, the, to lay out on our tables. And after every show, you could you could tell exactly where John sat <laughs> because his area of the table was just completely covered with splatter, uh, you know. Um, so I'd be like, all right, next show, John, this is where you're sitting. <laughs> so... Uh, or, or or otherwise, uh, the entire, after, after a year or so, the entire... Uh, um, tablecloth would be just covered in in splatter. Uh, let's see. This is a nice one here too. Super Soldier, the hammer. All right, I'm gonna try to do a sketch later, off stream. Um, Simple Man. Okay, nice. Simple Man's got one. Jeremy Joe. Cool. Joe. It's like a very much like a. Yeah. I don't know if John Paul was doing this, but every panel or every page seems like a Russian propaganda poster. There's the high contrast, the simplified uh, shapes, yeah. and then there's the composition with the lettering that it's very, it very much fits the, the type of story. I guess Tom Gomez. That's the good one. Yeah, no, I mean, he was very influenced. Again, he was very authentic with, with his approach. So everything had a particular feel to it. Uh, it was very bold, almost like a propaganda yeah. poster. Um, that whole book, if any, if anyone's read it, um, even from the writing standpoint, I know Brett Lewis was a little, he's a little bit crazy. He's like an embedded reporter. So he actually spent some time um, in the Russian subculture and hanging out with um, gang <laughs> Russian gang people so he he brought a very um, authentic feel to it and then John Paul was really the only one who can match that and John Paul like he would dive heavily into like old photos and <clears throat> find like any way he can to make it very authentic so the whole the work together is the two of them made a great story and it feels very real and neither of them are Russian so <laughs> right yeah yeah I mean, it's of, of any book in, in recent modern day, um, you know, a lot of times you pick up uh, comics today, you know, I flip through comics and the artist, uh, you know, there's hardly any background. I mean, it's just, they're just drawing figures and faces. And at some point you feel like this art is being lost um, uh, to this next generation. Um, and will we see another artist um, with this much dedication to the craft? Um, so it's, uh, you know, there's never going to be another uh, person like John. Uh, but you hope yeah. that. Not likely. Yeah. <coughs> For what I know of Gen Z, um, just being a Gen Z person, there's no way to do a deep dive into something. Um, mostly because Mark Zuckerberg kind of messed your brain up, and yeah. there's just no way to do this now. Well, you, know. you can hope that you know that John's work uh, inspires that you know the next person to be you know kind of like oh sorry Alex Tooth. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean you you do hope that. Um, it gets passed on to the next generation, or at least, you know, that that dedication to the craft, really. Um, all too many times, you know, flipping through Instagram or social media, you just see like, you know, well, they're like decent drawings uh, of faces or figures, but you know, this is comic books. This is a, this is a yeah. this is an artist who has dedicated his entire life to comic books, sequential illustration. Right. Um, not movies, not anything. I mean, although he did uh, do stuff for, you know, uh, the Bat Batman movies, he did concept design for um, other things. Tommy got him a lot of, um, Tommy worked with him on a lot of stuff. Um, I think they did a Spider-Man thing together. They did a, uh, different different projects. Um, but 
it was for the, for the bulk of his career it was comic books and um, I would hope that the industry in itself um, would in some way once we get back into conventions um, reaffirm that uh, dedication so What's really a shame is that uh, San Diego Comic Con never invited him as a featured guest. Um, well, all these conventions wanted to invite him, like uh, you know the ones that we go to, like when we went to sp um, Spain and all these other um, different shows. They were all much more appreciative of his work, but like a show like San Diego, never had him as a featured artist. Well, there is this term that they use for Alex Toth where they say he's like a, the best artist ever without a masterpiece. And that's not really meant as a slight. It's just that he's so good, but he, there's not one seminal work that he's associated with. And um, John Paul was kind of that same way. Like he jumped around on a lot of low-level books because it really wasn't about uh, what he was drawing. It was basically how he was drawing. And I think as an artist, you can... Um, get a high off of taking the you know the crappy writer, crappy um, title, crappy character, crappy company, and then if there's any appeal to that end product, it's 100% what you brought to it. And uh, I think like it wasn't until after he passed away that we really see that there are some seminal works of his. I mean, Winterman obviously was like his his big magnum opus. But then there was um, <coughs> Earth X, but. Mm -hmm. You know, <coughs> yeah. but yeah, I think there are people who usually have like try to latch on to a really big title, and yeah, I think that would have come next for him. But you know, it's really uh, his art is the same no matter what the project was. I mean, it was always a high level. Earth X is another yeah. great example. You know, I think uh, I think many all too many all too often Alex Roths uh, gets too much of the credit for Earth X. I mean, it was John Paul doing the heavy lifting on Earth X. Right. He was the one that drew every single panel, every single twelve issue miniseries nonstop. Um, you know, it's it's a shame at times when you reflect back on this industry that we've dedicated our lives to. Um, that uh, sometimes the credit doesn't go to the right people. Um, as an artist, I know John's always under. It's a big proponent of uh, meritocracy, of allow, allowing your work to speak for itself. Um, but off too often, uh, this industry in itself isn't a reflection of that, um, or in those kind of uh, lofty goals. So, let's hope uh, that. Uh, you know, this year or next year, as uh, shows begin to open back up, um, that there is a, a proper uh, dedication to what uh, he has contributed for the last 30 years. Yeah. And, and, and props to New York Comic Con, props to Read Pop. You know, uh, Mike um, was... Nick. Uh, huh? Mike Nagan, yeah. Mike Nagan. Yeah. And, and he was a huge, you know, I approached Mike and he was, I was like, Mike, you know, I'd like to do this panel um, to tribute uh, John, give John a tribute. And he's like, yeah, man, whatever you want, whatever you need. And so um, big ups to uh, Mike and, and all the guys over at Repop, uh, New York Comic Con, Florida Supercon, MCM London. Um, very, very appreciative of them um, allowing this. Uh, giving us an opportunity to showcase John's work. So, I mean, New York was his favorite show. So, uh, are there any other questions? I think we're going to wrap it up. It's been, you know, over two hours. It's almost midnight on the East Coast. Um, Sean, Fletch, <laughs> there's <coughs> still time to uh, get your book. <laughs> you know. Oh right, okay, yeah. So we're in the last hours of um, uh, the Are Zoom. Are we in the last hour? Is it over? <laughs> no, I think it's still going on. It's uh, we you may have one minute. 
But I think it closes out in the morning. Okay, good. Yeah. Right, so it closes out in the morning. Um, let me see, where's the link? It's basically an entire art school between covers. I mean, <laughs> I mean that's how I look at it. I mean, you can learn a lot from looking at that. And, and if you want to weigh the price against uh, going to school, <laughs> it's it's nothing, and you can get so much out of it. Well, it, it is a, it is a it is an expensive book, so I do understand if um, it's out of the cer certain people's price range. I'm not trying to really um, push too hard. Um, where is this uh, link? Here we go. Yeah, I think it's less than twenty four hours. Yeah, let me see. Where's the uh, less? That's a day left. Less than a day, because it opened up. I think uh, ten or eleven in the morning on a Wednesday. So uh, by the time we wake up tomorrow, the, the, it'll be over. But we're at one hundred sixty seven thousand. Um, is I'm blown away. Uh, <laughs> And that goes to his family. So one thing about John Paul is that he uh, he's not the fastest artist. And in, I asked him, like, what what are the th things that kind of are in the way? And then he, he would spend a lot of time um, with his daughter. Uh, I, I'm being a father myself. School takes a long time. Like, homework is sometimes over two hours long. And he did it all because he valued, valued her education. So um, he's not around to continue to make money to help pay for her college. So this is what, where we come in. And uh, you know that his his daughter's education was really important to him, so you know we're doing what we can to help fill the gaps. Well, because he's not able to. Yeah. Here are some of the images from his studio. Some of the pieces. I mean, these are these are concept sketches before starting before you start drawing the books, right? And they're fairly detailed they're fairly uh, each piece in itself is um, <laughs> already a, a, a masterpiece but um, wow <laughs> yeah so I'm already extremely appreciative I know his, his family is um, there's Scott Dumbier see Scott he used to run a poker game Oh, let's see the <laughs> let's see the Kim Jong Ji. Uh, while we talk, we can s watch this. It's funny, like there's a complete opposite in the way they work. I mean, John Paul was like the opposite of Kim Jong Ji. Everything is thoroughly researched, yeah. and it would take days to do a page. Well, you can see he has the drawing on the right, but I mean, if if, if John was at a convention, you know, he could draw this. He could draw like this on the spot, right? And uh, yeah. He was actually quite fast. Yeah, he was very fast. He just wanted to be able to be in that world in his head um, when he was working. And, um, you know, I think, let me see, Kim Jong-ji is referring to, uh, he, has a, he has a trade paper back there. He has some of the references, reference printed out. Um, and, look, yeah. and look at that, there's no pencil drawing on, on uh, Kim. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. And John would do that there's too. There's no... There's no layout at all. It all comes from his head, you know. He, he's you know, when I first met him, you know, someone can draw like that if they have a, if they are like a savant. So I thought, like maybe when I met him, I was gonna take a good look to see whether he was a little, little, you know. But he's a perfectly normal person. Yeah. So I'm not sure how th how this is possible. Maybe he's a robot. <laughs> do you think? Yeah, but do you think Master Kim Jong Ji can kiss with confidence? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you better put him on that list. Uh, we will see next week. Uh, um, <clears throat> I can't. I'm gonna go down to the to the mail room after this. I might have to do an earlier stream just to. But <laughs> yeah, this is uh, how long is this? This is 41 minutes. Let me let me jump a little bit ahead. Yeah. That's jeez. That's all purely just straight out of his head. Look at that. Yeah. So imagine like those two guys sitting next to each other at New York Comic Con. Um, yeah, there was always a line between um, John Paul. Always had a line.
from uh, starting out at the New York Penta Hotel or New York Plaza Hotel. Um, yeah, in the early days when we did uh, commissions, we I remember when we first started, it was uh, twenty dollars. Yeah, for drawing. <laughs> That first, uh, that first San Diego Comic Con, uh, we had to kind of drag John to go. He really didn't want to go. He didn't. He didn't like going to conventions at first. And uh, but uh, I was like, well, Sean's going to be there, right? And Tommy was going to be there. So I was like, let's just go. You have all this artwork sitting at home. Um, let's just go. We can hang out, like eat, drink afterwards. But then during the day, you know, do some commission, make some, you know, make a few hundred bucks or whatever, right? And lo and behold, that first show, man, he had a, <laughs> uh, the wad. I had a wad, yeah, <laughs> which which kind of well, started this the whole thing we we'll call the wad, but um, basically it was and it was paranoid to leave it in a hotel in the safe, so we had to carry it with him every day at the show, and it just got bigger and bigger. It's like this huge bulge <laughs> in his pants. Um, <laughs> right. But and, and that was all like twenty bucks at a time. Yeah, and we were only charging twenty dollars for a sketch. That so if you got a sketch like a nine by twelve, you know, almost a full figure ink sketch, for twenty bucks, and he Wait, it was the first time he had any artwork really out for sale. So he had some Earth X pages with him. Yeah, that was it. Was it was mostly the original art. Yeah, um, and so I think one guy came by and bought like three or four double page spreads from him. And it's like at some point I was like, oh man, you got maybe you should start charging more, because uh, <laughs> if a guy is buying a few, uh, you know, maybe you should start up, up in the price. And but John was always extremely reasonable uh, again with his pricing. Um, Remember, there was one guy who bought a piece from him, and then um, I think he claimed that someone stole it from him while he was carrying it around in his portfolio. Mm, right. And then he told the story to John Paul, and John Paul was like, "Oh, that's that sounds horrible. That's I'm so like sick with what just happened." So he gave him a piece. Yeah. <laughs> and we're like, "Oh, John, John Paul, that that has nothing to do with you. You know, that's that's that guy." And he's like, "Well, this guy's a fan. He came by to buy something. Someone stole it. He's leaving without a piece. Like he's like leaving unsatisfied. So he had to give him a piece." Yeah. <laughs> I think, wow. There the, were a few times too that he had um, people had gotten commission drawings from him, and uh, but then he later he saw that they were selling it on eBay or something, and you know it wasn't didn't make him too happy about that, and because each commission piece that he that he did for a person, uh, he had a, a very personal attachment to it, and um, you know it wasn't he wasn't doing it to make profit in a sense right. Um, for someone else to flip it, um, he was doing it because of the appreciation for the support and also for the craft. Um, with that said, uh, I think uh, we've been on here for over two hours. Let's let's wrap it up. Um, you, Jimbo, thank you so much. Uh, guys on the chat, DYO, oh, what's up, DYO Pickle, Golf Boy, D Rogers, uh, Crispy was here earlier. I think Mr. Joshua, Shoe Thief. Uh, Beef Skeleton. Oh, you guys, thank you so much for your support on this stream. Um, thank you for Roy Batty, Simple Man, James Quo, Golf Boy, Lurky Lurk. Thanks for your subs. Um, make sure if you're just watching, hit that follow button on the bottom. We're getting close to a 1,000. Once we reach a 1,000, Sean will tell you his worst uh, poop story. Right, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's none. Uh, if we reach a thousand and one, Fletch will jump in. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, Sorry. Uh, and then uh, hopefully the next time we'll have the the How to Kiss with Confidence book. But, anyways, um, thanks everybody for watching tonight. Um, say hello to. Uh, tell someone that you love that you love them. Um, life short and uh, make every moment count um, and we'll see you guys soon ha take, care. take care happy happy holidays. happy holidays happy holidays happy holidays